romantic age in the life of a plant, the opening of the flowers and the raising of the anthers covered with pollen. For the flowers to be fertilized, it is necessary for this pollen to be transferred from the anthers of one flower to the pistil of another, which is waiting to receive it. Most plants rely on bees to act as matchmakers and to carry the pollen from flower to flower. But this all-important pollen is a very delicate powder and the problem for every flower is how to put the pollen in the way of bees and yet keep it from being ruined by rain. For this reason, the snowdrop never dares to look up Living in perpetual fear of snowstorms, the flower opens its petals like an umbrella over the pollen. And the only way we can see the beauty of the flower is by taking a worm's eye view. Flowers are scarce in snowdrop time. So early bees don't mind turning into acrobats as they reach after honey and pick up pollen in the process. The tulip boldly stands upright and opens in the sunshine to show the pollen-laden anthers. But at the first hint of a passing cloud, the petals close again. It is worth looking to see how the petals make a completely waterproof joint. The spiderwort is so terrified of rain that the anthers turn inwards, the pistil follows, and the petals close over the flower which fertilizes itself and does not wait for bees. In summertime, plants, especially English ones, have to be prepared for sudden showers which might ruin the pollen. The mouse hood covers the anthers with a waterproof tent. Snapdragons keep their mouths so closely shut that not a drop of rain can beat through. Only the strongest bees can force their way to the honey and pollen. and then it's hard work. The poor man's orchid covers the anthers with its lower petals. The anthers catapult out the pollen if these petals are touched. makes the pollen into a paste and keeps it here. If the lower petals are pressed down, they bring forward a piston which pushes out the pollen. Our old friend Bertie, on a search for honey, gets some on his chest. will work the anthers of the meadow sage. They are pivoted onto a trigger, and if the trigger is pressed, they come down from the hood of the flower. Now come on, Bertie, and show us how you do it. In real life, the action takes place so quickly that you can hardly see it.
When the pollen has been got rid of, the pistil comes down to pick up pollen from another plant, and so the flower is fertilized. Some flowers have begun to rationalize the production of pollen, and the anthers and pistil collaborate. The anthers remain down here inside the plant and only produce the pollen. The pistil lifts it and puts it in the way of bees. It then prepares to pick up pollen from another flower. A plant that practices this cooperative method is the dandelion. The pistil is offering the pollen to the notice of insects. The dandelion pistil divides and waits three days in the hopes of picking up pollen from another flower. But if no bee brings any, it curls round and picks up the remains of pollen off its own stem. This, though you may not believe it, is the real flower of the dandelion. It is so insignificant that bees would never notice it. So about 200 of these little flowers cooperate and join together into what we call a dandelion flower. This striking mass effect which compels attention. In the same way, the tiny flowers of the globe thistle group together into one large flower head. This method of shop window dressing successfully attracts customers for honey and they distribute the pollen. On the same cooperative plan, the dull little cornflowers manage to arrange themselves into a most attractive flower head to their mutual benefit. Another step in rationalization is practiced by the daisy. In this flower, there is severe specialization in jobs. The flower head consisting of workers which produce the pollen and petals which act as advertising agents. The workers are placed in the middle while the advertisers are arranged all round. The result is good business. Customers are attracted and pollen is freely circulated. The advertisers of the car line thistle are its ring of attractive shutters. The everlasting flower uses its protective scales to attract attention to the flower head within. A natural everlasting flower is made up of workers and advertisers in reasonable proportions. But man has interfered with nature and has produced the double everlasting flower, a business proposition which looks good, but which is fundamentally unsound, all appetizers, and not a single worker to deliver the goods. This is just a colossal piece of bluff.